to mark the spot. Yeah. If you're in junior or senior high school, take off the Paradigm Cafe on the third floor and have a great time. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Somebody say, thank God for the word. Did y'all end up getting a handout this week? Is it in there? Stacy, thank you. I sent it to Stacy late this week. You got it in there? You're awesome. We have a wonderful pastoral team here. I don't know if y'all realize the depth of what God is doing. It is just absolutely amazing. They serve you well. I want to uh, take our time together. In fact, if you ever wonder why we take the time that we take, and we're, we don't seem to be in a hurry when we're worshiping and when we're ministering, and it's now 20 after, and we're getting to the Word, if you ever wonder why we don't seem in a hurry, it's because we're not, we're not doing a church service in here. Remember I taught you that? We're not doing, this is not about doing church in here. That we're Sabbathing together, you see? And us Sabbathing together means that we, we, we worship together, we fellowship together, we, we minister to one another, we commune together, and then we come and we sit at the, the feet of the Lord together and we receive the word. So just don't be in a hurry. We'll get you out in plenty of time to hit that buffet and uh, you're going to be fine. I want to I bring a message to you today entitled, No Longer Bound and no longer blind. And the reason that I want to bring that to you, and the reason that I think it's important is because of this, the number, the number one enemy of every Christian is spiritual blindness. Spiritually blinded to what it is that Jesus has done for you, and what is yours by virtue of the covenant, and the covenant that you have as revealed in the last will and testament. You see, that's what this is. This is the, this is the constitution of the believer. This is a covenant that was bought for, paid for, and provided for you individually by virtue of the blood of Jesus. And so this is your covenant. This is the will of God. Now listen to me. I said this before, and I'll keep driving this home. And you say it with me if you remember it. If it's in the will, it is the will. Okay? People say, well, I don't know if it's the will of God for my life. No, 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 no. You see, that's not how that works. God, God's not flaky about that. And so if it's in the will, if it's revealed in the Constitution, if it's revealed in the covenant, then it is his will, and you have every legal redemptive right to stand on the will. Amen. Because it's upheld in the court of heaven by the blood of Jesus. Listen, I got to tell you, if, if you're in big trouble, you don't want to buy, you don't want to, you want to pay for some cheap attorney. Come on, amen. You don't want to pay for some attorney that doesn't know what he's doing. Well, Jesus is your attorney. And he stands before the Father God and says, I bought it, I paid for it, it belongs to them, amen. And the works of the enemy are illegal. And so the number one, the number one enemy though of Christians is this spiritual blindness. I could use the word ignorance, but I don't want to use that word. But even if I did use that word, I wouldn't use it in this demeaning sense because to, to, to be ignorant is simply to be uninformed. Form. You are ignorant of a process, or you are ignorant of a particular kind of knowledge. You see, I moved here to the Midwest, and there are a lot of things about the Midwest and about farming and about corn, you see, that I was ignorant of. And I'm having to educate myself. I'm having to get up the speed on how this thing works, you see. So I was ignorant of that. And it's so it's easy for Christians to, to be ignorant, but let's not remain ignorant. Come on, amen? Turn to somebody and tell them, don't remain ignorant. Now, because it's a, it's a great bondage. 
that a born-again believer can get into is to walk around spiritually blinded and, and not aware of what it is that really belongs to you by virtue of this covenant that we have. It's, it's, like, it's like a physically blind person standing in a bright light, right in the middle of a bright light, but you have no awareness of it because you can't see it. Light is all around you, but you can't, you can't experience it because you can't see it. You see, when you are, when you are, jot this down, when you are spiritually blind, when you are ignorant of what is yours in this covenant, when you are spiritually blind, what happens is this, is that you subject yourself to be led all the days of your life by your natural senses. And there is nothing more aggravating than a born-again believer that is not led by his spiritual senses. But they're led by their natural senses. They're led by what they see and what they hear, what they feel, what they think. You see? They're led by those natural things. Now, when that happens, when you're spiritually blind and you don't know what belongs to you, you don't know what God's word, are y'all listening to me? You don't know what God's word says about any particular situation. Not only will you be led by your natural senses, you'll also be led by your emotions. I paused for dramatic effect. Turn to somebody and tell them, I know that person. No, no, no. I know that Christian that they're always led. You see, when, when you find a person that's always led by their emotions, it's because they're not being led by their spiritual senses. And what happens is this, when you're not led by the Spirit, when you're not led by, by the things that you know are true about the Word of God, every single time, and you make no mistake about it, doubt and fear will muffle the voice of the Holy Spirit, and you won't even hear God speak. And people say, well, I never hear the voice of the Lord. It's not because he's not talking. It's not because he's not speaking to you. If it's in the will, it... So you just heard the voice of God, you see? Now, when we talk about training to reign, and we use words like that, I'm training to reign in life. I'm training, the Bible says that we rule and we reign with Christ in heavenly places. When we talk about that, when we use phrases like, I'm learning how to live out of my spirit, what that means is this, is because you know we all have natural senses, the five senses, right? But you also have, jot these down because this isn't on your notes, okay? You also have spiritual senses, you have, you have the word of knowledge, you have the word of wisdom, you have prophecy, you have the discerning of spirits. Those are spiritual senses that the Lord wants, has given to you. And what he wants to do is for you to refine those. He wants you to, to fine tune those and to hone in on those. So that you're not just be led by your carnal emotions and your carnal senses. Because the enemy specializes. Listen, how many of you know that it's so easy and the opposite of fear is what? I mean, the opposite of faith is what? Fear. No. The opposite of faith is what? Yeah. No. The opposite of faith is, is what? Thank you. Chuck, thank you. Yesterday was Chuck's birthday, by the way. Hi, birthday, Chuck. That's an old dude. Now, the opposite of faith, and we say it every Sunday, and remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. So the opposite of faith is sight, you see, the things that you can see. But the enemy of faith is what? Fear. So the opposite of faith is living by what you see. It's living by the realm of the natural. It's living by things that you can actually witness have already materialized. You see, the reason it's difficult for some people to walk by faith is because we're living by something you can't even see in the realm of the natural, but yet you have a confidence that it's going to manifest. You see, but the enemy of faith is fear. Now, let me tell you what fear is. Fear actually is faith. They operate in the exact 
same atmosphere. They operate by the exact same principles, and they operate in the same environment. That's why it's so easy to go from, from, from faith over into fear. Now watch this. Fear was never mentioned in the Bible. There was no such thing as fear until Adam and Eve sinned against God. Adam never knew. He was going around the world. I mean, around the world. He was taking care of things all over, just supernaturally being transported around the world, taking care of all the things that God had commanded him to. And he never walked in fear. He never saw himself. Why? People think, here, here's a mistake that people make quite often. People think that Adam and Eve were just walking around in that garden without any clothes on. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. They think they were just walking around with no clothes on, and yet they didn't see themselves as naked. No, the reason they didn't see themselves as naked is because they weren't naked. They were fully clothed from the inside out with the glory of God. I mean, they had the fullness of God's glory all over them. There was no fear. There was nothing, but he was operated in the fullness. In fact, just like Jesus, Adam was operated in the fullness of faith without measure. Man, he was operating in faith. And it's just a regular part of who it was part of that supernatural race that God was creating and that if he hadn't have fallen, you and I would be those people today. So it wasn't that they were naked. And all of a sudden, the glory departed from him, just left him. And then he was naked. And they looked at each other and said, oh, this ain't good. I mean, could you imagine? You ever had those dreams and you show up to church in, in your tidy whities Hello? You ever had those dreams and you show up to Walmart in, in, your, in your pajamas or in your underwear? Can you imagine, watch, can you imagine being fully clothed and the next minute you're standing and you are stark naked in the middle of everything? Hello? The glory left him and he's standing there. He had no sense to do anything. And here is a man that had all the knowledge in the world, but all of a sudden sin impacted him to the degree and he was in such a state of shock. He didn't know what to do. He's looking down. He had no clue. He never even had a sense of how to make clothes. And so he goes and he puts together, you ready? He makes some riches out of fig leaves. He goes and finds fig leaves and sews fig leaves together and God says, where are you? And he said, watch this, watch this. I heard your voice and I was what? Afraid. And all of a sudden, fear entered into the human race. So what is this thing that we know of as fear? Fear is Adam's faith contaminated. Fear is Adam's faith contaminated. And you and I get to the place where we begin to walk in fear. And, and God says, you can't walk in faith. Write this down. You can't walk in faith and fear at the same time. You're going to have to make a decision. You see, am I going to believe the circumstances? Because see, that's what fear does. Fear puts its eyes in the natural senses that we were just talking about. Fear sees that thing in the realm of the natural. Get it? It sees that thing naturally. It sees that thing in the realm of the natural. And the result of seeing in the realm of the natural, when all of a sudden the glory of God had departed off of Adam and he saw himself naked for the very first time. And what happened? He was operating for the very first time in his life in the realm of the natural and the response was fear every single time you get over into the realm of the natural and are led by your carnal senses fear will always be the result but when you say god what is your plan for my life 
God, is what does your word say about what's going on inside of me? What does your word say about that relationship? What does your word say about my destiny? What does your word say about my purposes? What does your word say about my marriage? What does your word say about my children? What does your word say about my ministry? And I begin to stand on what God says about me instead of what my carnal senses say about me. And now I'm operating by my spiritual senses. And the result of operating in your spiritual senses is always what? What? Say it with me. Faith. Can I get an amen? Does everybody get this? So we're talking about this realm then of spiritual blindness. Now, the enemy wants to keep us blind. But thank God, the grace of God. Have I said the grace of God? The grace of God is the healing balm for that blindness. You see, grace, this is your first point there. Grace brings healing Grace brings restoration, it brings deliverance, it brings knowledge, and it brings spiritual insight. Now, I want to show you something this morning in our time together, and I, I won't take forever, but I want to show you something in this, in this message that Jesus preached, and in his preaching of this message, he's actually declaring to the masses and declaring to you and I two things. He's declaring his job description as the Messiah, the anointed one. He's declaring his job description, but he also declares the job description of the church, of you and of I. And listen to what he says, okay? Because actually what's going on here. This is not Jesus referring to all these different groups of people. What he's doing, and I and put this on the screen, this is what I call the degradation of the demonic. That's what Jesus is de describing and defining, the degradation of the demonic. In other words, Jesus describes, in, in, here when we look at this in Luke, Jesus describes a downward spirit spiral that without the divine intervention of God, without the divine intervention of men and women of God, like you and I, into people who are being trapped and people who are being deceived by the enemy, they will go down this path that Jesus describes, the degradation of the demonic. And listen to what he says. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has, watch this, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The word anointed is the word karomai. Say that with me. Karomai. I had my little girls uh, practice this in the uh, living room the other day. Karomai. And here's what karomai is. is, is this is from the word, the word charis, charis. Charis, the, the, the grace, the anointing of God, the gift of God. Watch this. Karamai literally means to receive alone. Okay? Now, I, I, it would have been very nice if we would have had the ability when we moved here just to write a check and just to buy our house. And there are people that do. There are some of you that have been able to do that. Thank God for that. You see, we did not have that ability. So what we did, we had the ability to put our down payment on it. And then we went to the Karomai, we went to the bank, and we then, we, we took advantage or we took opportunity of their power to pay for that house and we chiromide we received a loan from them you see they had the power to write a check for the entire amount of that house and then they empowered us they enabled us to purchase that house on their purchasing power y'all with me okay that's the anointing you see, we went and received that loan, and now we are living in a house that belongs to us and to the bank. They came along beside us and said, we will, because you lacked the ability to write that check for the total amount, we will come alongside of you, and we will empower you with what we have, but now it's going to cost you something. That's when you want to pay your loan off what? Yeah, now watch this. So, karomai, the, the anointing, 
It's the, now this, I think this is in your notes, it's the supernatural enablement of God that exceeds your natural capacity, okay? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of you and he helps you in your weaknesses. He helps you. That's this word. He anoints you. In other words, the Holy Spirit anoints you by the spiritual senses. He anoints you to be able to hear. He anoints you to be able to discern. He anoints you to be able to, to, to see things that you couldn't see in the realm of the natural. You don't have the ability in and of yourself, but he does. And so he comes alongside of you, and he anoints you to know things that you would never know. He comes alongside of you, and he empowers you to do things that you would never be able to do before. We were praying with somebody, and all of a sudden... <laughs> God gives you a word. He gives you a word of wisdom. He gives you a word of knowledge. He gives you a discerning of spirit. What is that? That's living by the spiritual senses, not by the natural senses. Come on, amen. Is this helping anybody at all yet? All right, I'm taking you somewhere, so just be patient with me. So he says this. He says, I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. The word poor means to be literally bound up by a spirit of poverty, and, I, and he says, I have, watch this, you've got to see this, because what the Lord is saying is that I have set myself against the spirit of poverty, because it literally means this, the word means bound up by the spirit of poverty by virtue of the fact that Christian virtue is lacking. In other words, the spirit of Jesus is adamantly opposed to the spirit of poverty. Now watch what happens. He says, and also I've been healed. I've been sent to heal the brokenhearted. That word is suntribo, and it means lives that have been shattered. Lives that have been broken down and, and tread upon and to preach deliverance to the captives, those that have been captured, taken, and bound. So I want you to see this degradation of the demonic. So it begins with this, this, this let's take one person, Okay. And they, they are poor because they are destitute of a Christian virtue. They don't know Christ. And so there is a, a poverty. There is a spiritual poverty. And always with the spiritual poverty comes this, this, sense of, this sense of a lack and this sense of a void and this sense of a want. Oh, it can be propped up and it can be, it can be dealt with, but it never really lasts. And so there's this, this, this poor, and then that same person, until somebody comes in, look at me, everybody, until somebody comes in and shares the gospel, the good news of grace with them, and says, God has a perfect plan for your life, they go from being poor, to now all of a sudden there's this, this sense of who they are in life, to now all of a sudden they're, they, they're shattered. Their lives, are in bro their lives are broken, their lives are in pieces, and, and they've been wounded time and time again, and the enemy comes in and he takes advantage of them. And it happens through a variety of things, either a divorce or a death or a, a job loss, and all of a sudden there's this, this shattering of the lives. But it's not just natural circumstances of life. It's literally a demonic attack that has come against them because the enemy has targeted them. They go from being poor to shattered, and now all of a sudden, they're in this place where because of the, the spirit of poverty that's on them and the shattering of their lives, there, there's nothing in them to fight. And so when you're not able to fight, when you're broken and when you're wounded, what happens? The enemy then is able to capture you easily because all of your defenses have been broken down. And so the degradation of the demonic goes from being poor to being shattered to being captured, bound. And then finally, the last thing happening here is that, is that they are blinded. And now they can't even see. I was poor, and, and things just begin to get worse. And Jesus said, and you got to know, that's the state of humanity as I see it. And Jesus said, you also have to know that not only do I see humanity in this way, but I have come to set the captives free. I, I've come to, to bring recovery. I've come to, to heal the brokenhearted, deliverance to the captive. And we get to the statement that's our focus today, and he says this, and I've come to bring recovery of the sight to the blind and liberty to those that are bruised. I, I could probably stop at any particular point in this message today and talk to you about the things that God wants to do in our lives. I want to pause very briefly here as I talk about what, what I call the bruises of Satan. And you have to know that Jesus not only wants to heal those things of your past, 
from which you've been ensnared in and those things that have shattered you and not only from your blindness, but he also wants to heal you of your bruises. I, I went uh, last week, two weeks ago, and, and, and I had blood drawn so that my doctor could, you know, just look at everything. And, and so I had blood drawn and they put the white thing on there and everything was fine. Just a little bitty, uh, you know, poke and put the, the white thing over there. Then that night I was just sitting at home and I looked over and I felt a little something, and I looked over, and there was this huge bruise right there. And then I don't know exactly what she did or did wrong or didn't do. I don't, I don't know, but there was a huge bruise there. And you know me, I got to touch it. I can't just ignore it. I got to touch it. How many of you ever had a bruise? You, rump, you, you bumped into the table in the middle of the night, you know? That's the worst. I think the greatest pain ever inflicted upon a man in his entire life as stepping on a Lego in the middle of the night in the living room. <laughs> or bumping into that table right there, the very edge of that table. And it always hurts worse at night, am I right? And it leaves this bruise and, 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 I, and I reached over and I touched it. And how many of you know that it was what? It was tender and I could feel it and it was, it was sore. The bruising was sore itself. And that's exactly how the enemy is many times in our lives. And see, bruises are different than scars. Scars can become reminders of, 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 of something that happened in the past. But a scar indicates that something has what? It's left a mark, but there's been healing there. It's healed up. It's no longer impacting you in any real way except it looks ugly. Somebody, I, I was pressure washing my, my daughter's playground and, and I was on the stairs, which you should have, I should have known at my size and my age, it's the last thing I should have been. And all of a sudden, and I got to be honest with you, the, the screws were about that far from the edge, which I'm pretty certain that's why this ladder collapsed. Hello? <laughs> I'm standing and I'm watching this and I'm about halfway up this ladder and as I, as I was standing there, all of a sudden, the three rungs, and I just fell all the way to the bottom, and there were these two brass three, four-inch length screws sticking out, and as I went all the way down, those screws just dug right into my leg, and I just got these, really? I've got these massive, ugly streaks running down my leg, and, and when they healed, they didn't heal pretty. They healed ugly. And now I've got these beautiful legs. <laughs> with these massive looking scars going down them. i got scars all over. I have told my kids every story in the book. Listen, i got this big scar across this knee right here. What, Lauren? I fought a bear one time. I got trapped by a, by a bobcat. I wrestled an alligator. Dad, where'd that scar come from? True. Yeah. Listen, and I've got these scars there, and somebody, and I, and I forget all about them because I, I, I don't, you know, when I had a pair of shorts on, and I think we were playing golf, and one of the guys that we were there with, he looked over and he goes, and I'm, we're all just standing around, and he looks over and he says, "Those are the ugliest legs I've ever seen." <laughs> all battle scarred everywhere, and. You know, but listen, but they don't cause me any pain, hallelujah. Listen, but a bruise is different. And what the enemy does, he specializes in, in causing, the, causing the, the issue to, to go away, but he'll leave a bruise there. He'll leave a reminder there. And then every now and then, just when you think you've come to a point of recovery, just when you think you've come to a point of restoration in your life, he'll just reach over and he'll push that bruise. And it, and it hurts just enough to bring back the conflict. It hurts just enough to bring back the pain that was caused when it was inflicted in the first place. He, he'll push it just enough to remind you of those words that were spoken over you by that mother or by that father or by that aunt or by that brother or by that boss or by that teacher or even by that preacher or by that Christian or by that neighbor, somebody that said something to you. And Jesus, I, I love what he says here. He says, he says, and... Uh, he says, I've come to set at liberty those that are suffering under the bruises of Satan. And he, now what's he doing? He's, he's moving, from, he's moving from, from healing and he's moving now into health. And by the way, and I, let me start to close here. 
Listen, he says, and I'm, I'm here to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Let me tell you what that is. The acceptable year of the Lord is not a year at all. In fact, what the acceptable year of the Lord is this. The acceptable year of the Lord is a season. And it's a season where God's purposes came into full cycle because of the redemptive actions of Jesus Christ. And so he came into full circle and the redemptive plan of God, it was lost by Adam, the first Adam, but it was regained by the last Adam. You see, the first Adam was this life-giving soul. He lived, he lived in, out of the realm. Once he fell, he lived out of the realm of his natural carnal senses. And he took life. And in fact, it, life was demanded to cover up for his sin. And the very first Adamic covenant happened when God saw Adam and he was operating in the natural senses and he was operating in fear and he saw himself as naked because he was, because he had been stripped of his God clothes. He had been stripped of the glory of God. And God says, he, God says, I love you enough. You, you have sinned against me. You have broken my heart. You have disappointed me. But I love you enough that I'm going to, even in the, in the middle of your sin, I'm going to restore you. And God killed an animal. And by that, he, he instituted the Adamic covenant. And that, the blood from that animal covered his sin, paid the price. God accepted that as, 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 as restitution of his sin. And then God took the skin of that and made Adam a brand new suit. You see, all Adam could do in his, now listen, look at me, everybody. All Adam could do in his own natural ability was just stumble through that garden and sew together some fig leaves. And so many of you and I, that's what we were busy in our lives, putting fig leaves together going, don't I look good? And we're like, dude, do you realize you're wearing fig leaves? But when you come to God, God says, I'll redeem you, I'll restore you, and I'll, and I'll make a suit for you. Can you imagine fig leaves sewn together by a man who had never sewed a thing in his whole life, which is most of us, had never sewed anything together in his whole life, knowing how long could a fig leaf last being sewed together, and what he sewed together with a vine? What a mess he was making. And could you imagine then coming with an outfit made by Father God himself? Now, he, he, went from, he went from whining to styling. And the father said, and I want you to know, you blew it, but I forgive you. And my But in Christ, Adam was a life-taking soul, but Jesus, the last Adam, was a life-giving spirit. Come on, amen. Now, go ahead, bro. I want to just close with this whole thing because he says I'm going to open the prison doors that, that phrase is a, is a Hebrew term that means opening up the eyes to those who are bound and that's what we're talking about today is being spiritually blind and I, and I entitled this message from the beginning no longer bound and no longer blind in fact I had to laugh because I, I was auto speaking that title to Tom, who does the the CDs out there, he said, "What's the message of the? What's the title of the message today?" And I put, "No longer bound, no longer blind." And when I looked at it, it said, "No longer bound, no longer blonde." <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> Opening the prison door is a spiritual concept that means to to open up our our understanding. And it means to open our spiritual understanding, not our natural carnal senses, but our, our, our spiritual senses. And, and Jesus, is, and he does that, by, by, he does that by, by his grace. You see, these, he's, he's talking to captives who were held under bondage of a law that did two things. It, it told them that they were neither righteous and nor were they accepted. And see, and that's what legalism does for you. Legalism brings you to the place where you, you're never really fully good enough or you're never really fully accepted because you're not fully good enough. Some of you grew up under that heavy hand. I grew up under a heavy hand of my father that everything had to be just right. 
And the result of that heavy hand of never really being fully good enough, never really being fully accepted, caused me to live under a spirit of rejection. I was vulnerable to a spirit of rejection because all my life I was never really fully good enough. And when I came to my life before the Lord and I, and I saw my heavenly father, what I believed about my heavenly father is exactly what I believed about my earthly father, that I was never really fully good enough and I was never really fully accepted by my heavenly father because that's the only image of a father and a father heart that I had ever known. And yet God comes to me and he says, not only are you fully accepted, but you're good enough. But you're not good enough because of your own efforts. You're good enough because of my grace that is upon your life. I want to give you a working definition of the word grace, and it's this. It's the, and I think this is on your notes. It's the express favor of God that releases the enabling power of God into your life. You see, we've always heard grace and mercy, and I hear people put it like this. My brother, grace is the unmerited favor of God, and what that means is that God gives you what you don't deserve. Well, thanks a lot. I pretty much grew up under that. And everything that I got, I got it, but I sure as heck didn't deserve it. And I always felt like I didn't deserve it. And I come to the Lord and you're telling me that the grace of God in my life is that God throws me a bone and he'll throw me something, but even though he threw it to me, I'm still not deserving? Listen, I gotta tell you, I stand today before you prophetically and I refute that definition. Grace is not you getting something that you don't deserve. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It's the express favor of God directly to you. And his favor over you enables his power to operate inside of you. What, let me tell you what grace is. Grace is God posturing you to receive everything that belongs to you because of his redemption in your life. That's the grace of God. And it's a blessing. God doesn't go, well, I'm going to give it to you. It'd be like me telling my daughter, well, I'm going to give it to you. You don't deserve it, nothing head. It ain't like that. It's me going, baby, my grace for you means this, is that everything that I have belongs to you. My, my grace for my wife is, is that, okay, well, I'm going to do that for you, you know. But I'm just going to do it, and you really didn't deserve it. No, it's me going, I'll give you that and anything else that you want that's mine. That's my grace, and it comes out of my passion and my heart and the favor that I have for you. Come on, Amen. That's the God that you serve. Listen, obedience, and I'll close with this. I got a whole other section, but I'll close. Has this helped anybody at all? Watch this. Obedience under the law says that we have to perform to get God to act on our behalf. Obedience under the law says that you got to be good enough for God to, to choose you. You got to be good enough for, for, for God to heal you. You don't deserve healing. You don't deserve blessing. You don't deserve prosperity. You don't deserve a happy life. You don't deserve that spouse. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't deserve the, the favor and the blessing of God in your life you have, because you haven't earned it. Listen, obedience under grace is walking in faith. Obedience under grace means this. It means that Jesus has already done everything that needs to be done, and I believe it. And now, because I believe it, I can, I can act on it. You know what that faith does? It allows me to walk in obedience to his spirit. Listen, under the law, we have to first be faithful to God in order for him to be faithful to us. But how many of you know that under grace, it's not about what you can do, it's about what he's already done. You see, you got a great future ahead of you, but you'll never fulfill it as long as you try to pull it off in your own strength. You'll never fulfill it as long as you try to be good enough to get this job done. Because the bottom line is you're not good enough. Bottom line is you're, you're not that consistent. Now watch this. How many of you are glad that God's grace isn't dependent upon your faithfulness. 
Come on, amen. God's grace is independent. And listen, and, and, when, and when, you, when you sin and when you fall and when you, when you come short of his glory, God doesn't say, sucks to be you. You, you, you. I had you going somewhere. I had a plan for your life. But now you just blew it. Now what God does is God says, come here. I not only want to restore you, I not only want to forgive you, but I want to take the thing that the enemy has used against you, and I'm going to break that power off of you, and I'm going to draw you to myself. I remember when my son, oh my dear Lord, I didn't think that boy would ever, ever, ever learn to ride a bicycle. He'd get out there, and man, I mean, I'd be pushing him across the yard, trying to balance in him, trying to hold him up. And we all have a big old long gravel driveway, and, and I'm just trying to hold him up. Man, my back's aching, my legs are aching, and, and, he'd, and, and I'd be like, and then he'd fall, and I'd go get him. And finally I'd say, son, that's all I got in me today. Let's do it another day. And we'd go out there, and I mean, it took forever. But you know what? I, I didn't tell him, son, you know, I don't think you're ever going to get this. And you know what? Because you keep falling, I'm done with you. I just kept going back out there. And I kept holding him up. And I kept encouraging him. And I kept telling him, you, you can do this. And one day I was pushing him. And I don't know what happened, but the heavens opened up. <laughs> Angels descended. <laughs> And all of a sudden, and I, I, it just like blew my mind. I'm pushing him, and all of a sudden, he just takes off. He, something clicked on the inside of him, and he just took off. And he's way down yonder at the end of the yard. I mean, way down there. Come back up around, you know. And I'm like... That was rude, but it was funny. <laughs> you know what? And now he's driving. <laughs> I can say that it's clicked a little bit quicker. Hallelujah. I did tell him that we went down uh, in central Illinois to some friends for Thanksgiving. And, and I told him, I said, son, I, I got the whole family in the car. I can't risk them with you. <laughs> Father, today, we're no longer bound. We're no longer blind. I love the story in Elijah and his servant. When they were trapped, and Elijah, his servant said, what are, what are we going to do? And Elijah prayed the prayer, and he said, Lord, open his eyes he would see and when his spiritual perception when his spiritual eyes were opened he saw angels and chariots of fire surrounding ready to do battle Elijah already saw it today God come on would you just right where you sit would you just Hold your hands or maybe even put your hands on your eyes or on your heart. Awaken in me today my spiritual senses. I will not be led by fear. No matter what's operating in my world right now, I'm not focusing on this situation. I'm focusing on what is in the will regarding this situation. I'm seeking the will to that thing. I'm seeking the plan of God for that. I declare over myself that I am the field of God. Some of you need to jump in on this real quick now. Every organ in my body operates according to the way that it was designed to. I have the mind of Christ. 
this. And I think that the boss is a Christ. And because I have the mind of Christ, I hold fast to the thoughts, the feelings, the purposes, and the intentions of Christ. I walk in the forest, and I am the head, and I am the tail. I put a guard on the gates of my life. I know who, what I see, what I hear, about what I feel, about what I think. But I stand steadfast in faith. I can envision that God can and God will. I stand in grace, the express favor of God over me that has enabled in the power of God to work in me and through me. I'm a man of favor. I'm a man of the anointing. I'm a woman of the anointing. My family lives by the anointing. I believe today that I receive it and I believe that even as I pray, in Jesus' name, once that they had, they had, all stand together, thank God for the word, amen. But now may the Lord bless you, put your hands up, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, may the Lord God lift his countenance upon you and may he give you his peace. May you live all the days of your life walking in the authority of the grace that is yours because of the redemptive purposes of Jesus will be.